Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the hit show, a story written by a current prisoner. You know, I just want to go ahead and remind you guys, man, that this is not a game. This is not a lie, man. This is real life, man. Real people are serving real life sentences, man. This gang lifestyle, man, is for the birds, man. Don't throw your life away, man. Check yourself before you wreck yourself. You know what I'm saying? Because everything that's around you right now, you can lose at the drop of a hat, man. Seriously, check yourself before you wreck yourself, man. We have Armando Polito, man, coming through with one positive message, man, before he introduces his friend, man. He's going to be introducing a few more figures, man, to the show, man. We are creating a great, great team, man, a great bond ship, man. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and let him take over, man, and do his thing, man. Please hit that like button and show some support for us. And please hit that subscribe button if listening to prison interviews is your thing. It's your boy right here, Tony, and I'm out. Shout out to the homie, Tony. It's another teachable moment. Coming to you live from the pen. Glad you're tapping in. For those of you that may not know who I am, I'm, my name is Edmundo Polito. I'm serving a 35 to life sentence for two second degree murders. Today, today I'm a person who who's not afraid to speak on his uh his shortcomings. I express myself freely. Who I was growing up, I was an overweight kid who was bullied and uh, which did a number on my self-esteem. Along with uh, being molested as a young boy, so the perception of myself was this big. It also didn't help that I had a learning disability. So when I joined that gang, it made everything that I felt evaporate. So I never confronted my issues. I wore that facade and Underneath that mask, man, I didn't want nobody to see what was under there. The way I confronted my issues was through violence. So when I was there, whenever I was put down or talked down on, I responded in not really the best of ways. So today, I'm not afraid to let people know my struggles. And uh, I still low-key struggle with my ADD. When I talk to people, sometimes... It's hard to catch on to emotional cues. I have to read things over and over just to understand them. And I also got to tell people, ask people to repeat themselves for me so I can understand what we're talking about. But with that being said, that that doesn't make me incapable or incompetent. But I wrote you guys something today. This is for the young bro on probation. The one who hasn't made that choice yet. And for the one who had made that choice, keep being that pawn, little bruh, until it's too late. And until it's too late, bruh, I'll probably see you right here slide through. With that being said, I got something for you. You can check out my videos I already posted on this channel to catch yourself up. Today, we're going to talk about loyalty. There's a misconception kids have about their hood, being like a second family, brothers they never had. They think that if this dude is willing to fight for me, shoot for me, or kill for me, that must be loyalty, right? Wrong. Because when them cuffs get put on, the only thing that dude is loyal to is their own reflection. Sell you out, testify, and take a deal. We'll get into my cousin in a We'll get into my cousin in a later segment. Who are, you know, my cousin who wore a wire. For now, I want to tell you how I ended, how I ended up in that jail cell in the first place, so that he could set me up. Disclaimer: I own my beef. I pled guilty. I'm doing my time, but I never told on nobody, and I stayed loyal to my family, my real one. Not the politics that left me and my family hanging. So I'm a former Norteño from Salinas Acosta Plaza. Our politics are, there are no red on red funk, period. That's exactly how I got shot and my cousin got murdered in front of me. We was at a house party, homies, no enemies, but a young drunk dude has his word with, words with my cousin. They scrap outside, one on one, and the side buster steps in, pulls a gun, a bitch move. By anybody's standards, I'm hit, he dies, 
and the big homie in the pen somewhere from the NF said sends word down saying that he can't retaliate. That hood don't have to get up give up the shooter. They let him leave out of town. They let him leave out of state. We just supposed to take the L. We said, hell nah. You kill my family and you don't get punished. You get to leave and we gotta suck it up. Nah, bro. See these shot collars? You taxing hoods. You gotta pay rent to be active in Kelly. And them old dolphins in the bay, Pelican Bay, counting shots. Care about one thing. And one thing only. Their money well, two things. Their money and the dope that the dope that gets them high. They see problems like this as a money interruption. They don't care that my fam was killed in violation of the street code. And they let that hood slide. No punishment. That's what these kids don't understand. The life means nothing to these dudes at the top. The rules only exist to be enforced if and when a dope says so. And we found out the hard way. I caught a 15 life second degree for my retaliation. The shooter bounced, so we hunted for one of theirs, which was an innocent man, and I felt justified at the time. I was technically no good as soon as I got my retaliation. And that's ironic. I'm no good for avenging my family. I'm no good for avenging my family member. Kills killed by somebody by somebody for some for their action. But that hood didn't have to pay for that bad action. Politics is bullshit. Fellas, fake ass label dopings put on to bad decisions that don't respect your life and only care about being high and being paid. There is no loyalty, my boy. That's the lesson today. We are here to deconstruct this fake ass gang mythology. You might hurt your feelings, but we don't care. We're here to save a life. This channel is about mentorship. So if you're watching, you're in law enforcement, media, probation, use us. Lean in. Let's build. At the end of this segment, we have my contact info. Get at me via e via mail, email, email through me, email me through the GTL and getting out at Write a Prisoner, my YouTube channel, FML Confessional, or my TikTok at FML Confessional. I want to introduce you to my little brother. He's doing 30, 30 to life. For a second degree murder as well. But he started banging in third grade, got his first face tattoo in the sixth grade. He caught his case at age 16. Pay close attention. Till next time, it's your boy. Thank you. Just say, all right, <clears throat> well. Hi, um, shout out to uh, Tony and Bruja for facilitating my appearance today. Thank you for tapping in with me. I'm Savage. The picture you clicked on to access this video is me at the age of 14 when I was fully doing my Dougie, or so I thought so. I'm 24 now. It's been over a decade since, since then, and it's taken me that long to finally get bold enough to show myself. I'm here to talk to that kid that's on probation but not yet in a game. You're important, my boy. You really are. You don't need fake friends, fake family, or fake loyalty. Um, you need, you. need First of all, you don't need nobody's approval. The only approval that you need is your own as a man and to stand on your own two feet and make your own decisions. I don't wanna see you come here. I don't wanna meet you in a blue CDCR shirt and wearing the same clothes that I'm wearing and eating the same food. Because um, if you come here, you probably didn't listen to the video and I need you to listen. When I was in juvenile hall, a group of people came with this writing poem, right? with this writing program. It was, uh, it was based upon poetry to speak, well, to write down and speak everything that you feel inside and really just let it out 
So they gave us this paper with these questions to try to get us to open up. But um, we were too gangster and too thugged out to to answer them. Well, 10 years later, I still have this paper. So I'm going to go down the list with you. And we might not finish today, but we will sure try to finish it. And with each one, I'm going to answer it. And I'm going to answer it with heart and all honesty and sincerity so you guys can get an understanding of what the gang life really is. So my home experience was a very tough one. Um, I come from a very cultural Mexican family where men don't cry and women don't work. They're forced to stay at home and just pop out baby after baby. Uh, I lived in Mexico and it was very, very violent in my household. Uh, my dad was what you would call a machista. He didn't let my mother do anything. He spoke for her, he taught for her, and um, he pretty much beat up, uh, he beat us all up. Um, he was what you would call a human smuggler. Uh, he crossed people over to the United States for a better living. Uh, he was heavily using methamphetamine and I experienced it all. I seen it, I seen it and I didn't know what was happening. I thought maybe this happens in every household. And I later found out that it was a very unhealthy environment for a young boy to grow up in. And my experiences after crossing to the United States were a cultural shock. Uh, the Mexicans that lived here in the United States were in the state of California were way different than the ones that I knew in Mexico. Um, the mom worked. The mom made sure the kids were up and ready every morning and the husband wasn't abusive. So to me, it shocked me. Well, when I started second grade in school in LA, I didn't know English. I couldn't pick it up. My sister picked it up, spoke it fluently in six months, and I figured maybe it's just not for me. Well, my dad decided that maybe we should move to a more ag agricultural society and environment where he grew up in, and uh, we moved to the Central Valley, and school there was very tough for me. Uh, kids did not talk like me. They didn't dress like me and definitely did not like the same things I did. So I got bullied a lot. I would get beat up every time. Every time I went to recess, I was getting beat up. I was getting put up in the restrooms. There was times where I was dying to go to the restrooms, but I was so afraid to just like go because I knew that they'd follow me there just to beat me up because I didn't understand them. I didn't understand English. I hardly spoke it. I Maybe I understood the basic, hi, good morning, how are you doing? And all I would say is, hi, that's all I knew. And my biggest dream when I was growing up was becoming a brain surgeon. Um, yeah, uh, I believed I was smart enough to become a brain surgeon. I always liked the idea of being paged in a hospital as patient Dr. Vargas. Um, and if not, then I wanted to be uh, in the Navy. I wanted to be a black ops. I wanted to be a Navy SEAL. I saw my first American war movie and I thought I can be just like that man right there to serve a country. And I wanted to serve this country because it allowed my family to stay here. and. I figured I'd give back by fighting for the freedom of every American citizen and things didn't pan out that way. And the reason why my dreams didn't come true. Okay, here's the real one. Um, my dreams didn't come true because of the lack of motivation in my life, the lack of like positive role models. I was predestined. Uh, my family had already predestined my future, so I thought what they decided for me was what I was going to become. They told me that I would always end up in prison. 
and I thought maybe that's what it is. And I didn't have no more dreams of becoming a doctor or a Navy SEAL. The only thing I knew was, okay, I have to go to prison. It's the manly thing for a Mexican to do. Um, my earliest, my earliest, like, examples of that I can describe to you that I experienced that I knew changed my life in school where I would always get beat up and I decided to one day fight back and when I fought back I got suspended when I got suspended I got hit at home and I would get hit at home because they realized that I was getting hit at school for the longest and finally decided to fight back so they would send me back to school to fight again but then contradictful, I would get beat up again at home for getting suspended for fighting. So they really didn't know how to make up their minds. And um, I was in third grade, almost the ending of the school year when I was introduced to marijuana. Uh, I, it just looked like dried up grass to me. And uh, I wanted to be cool. I wanted to finally have friends. And uh, the dudes that were bullying me one of the main ones before he took me under his wing i caught him smoking in the restrooms and i said oh that's cool and i wanted to be so liked so so welcomed like like look i know i don't speak your language but i'm cool like i'm a cool dude like i just want a friend to kick you with that school right and uh they never offered me they never they didn't want to be nowhere near me but I felt cool just knowing that I was in the restroom with them while they got high, while they got drunk. And you picture, we're just in third grade. We're kids. We're supposed to be running around and playing soccer, playing marbles, playing in the playground. Um, well, this is where my experiences with gangs came in. My experiences with gangs came in when he decided to speak to me for the first time after giving me the, after beating me up one last time, he realized that I had heart because for a whole school year, I never told, I never cried. I went there and I took it like a champ. So I thought um, he stretched out his hands and he said, hey, this is why we do this. This is who we are. We're Northern Hispanics, we're, we're gang members. And I said, oh, that's cool, what is that? And they broke it down to me and I just, I just thought it was a bunch of people kicking it together, you know, like as friends, as a, a cool little family. I didn't think nothing much of it. They didn't explain to me the violence. They didn't explain to me the politics. I just knew, oh, these guys are gangsters, I guess. So it's all right. And I didn't judge them. I just wanted to be liked and I wanted to be their friends. And I ended up messing up. I one day I remember it was summer vacation. It was I was transitioning to be a fourth grader. He introduced me to his he introduced me to his older brothers and um his older brothers just had recently came out of prison and they showed no remorse. They were very blunt, they were very cruel and they said you kick it here you're not just gonna be kicking it here if you're not a, a northerner. And I was so shocked because I was like, if I don't join, these guys won't be my friends. So I said, what does it take to be one of you guys? And they told me you gotta have heart and you have to be smart and you have to be cruel and heartless. And I knew that I was the exact, the exact opposite. I wasn't that. But because I wanted to have my friends, I said, I'm in, I want to. And I was eight years old when they grabbed five kids that were older than me. And they said, beat them up 14 seconds. And it just went on from there. It went on and on. And after the 14 seconds were done, they finally told me you're from the hood. So now you no longer think for yourself, talk for yourself, and do anything for yourself. Anything that you do will be for the benefit of us, the people. And they sold me the dream. They sold me the propaganda. 
they told me this is what we sport this is our color this is our number this is what we stand for but they never told me the bad things about it they never told me the negatives they never told me the cons they always told me all the pros the nobody will ever pick on you nobody will ever bully you nobody will ever ever come to you and try to get crazy with you bro because they'll know what you are and they know that they mess with you they mess with all of us so i thought oh wow i no longer get to get beat up at school so i thought why not right and um well let's see the question number eight this is a good one what do i think the gang did for me that i did for the gang the gang never did nothing for me and i'm gonna be very honest with you i'm gonna be very blunt I transitioned from fourth grade to the fifth grade as a little gang member. They didn't know anything. I just knew the gangs and I started getting laced up more and more about it. Uh, when I was 11, I transitioned to sixth grade and this is where it really got exposed to me. Uh, there was another gang there and I guess there were, were our enemies and I never knew and I did whatever it took to show everybody around me that I was the hardest dude in that school, in that street, in that city. So I went missing for two weeks, showed up to school with tattoos on my face. I had four dots and two teardrops. And at the time I thought it was cool. I thought I earned them. I did, I shedded sweat tears and blood for my tattoos and people like me people are afraid of me i put on this mask and painted my face to hide who i really was behind all that and i had a model but they gave up on me they only tried once and they just dumped me. I was like that candy bar that you open walking down the street and you don't have the decency to throw the wrapper in the trash can. Well, I'm the wrapper that you just throw on the side of the road and stuff. And I, I give them respects for trying, but if I could have had someone very like there in my life just to just guide me and tell me that everything that i'm doing is wrong i wouldn't be here i ended up getting arrested going to seventh grade and just never came out i got arrested for my first time for a for assault on an officer because i thought that's what gangsters did well it turns out that you do a lot of time for it and that's when everything really got exposed to me. When I went in there, I was surrounded by different races, different gangs, and that's when I realized that everything there was like in the 1800s. Like, if you're Hispanic, you go here. If you're African-American, you're there. If you're white, you're here. Everybody was segregated by their own race and their own gangs, and it was very shocking to me. And the two predominant gangs there were Northern Hispanics and Southern Hispanics. And I felt bad for the kids coming in there that didn't game bang, that were forced to join a gang because they would get picked on. They would get bullied and they were afraid to get all their stuff taken. And uh, at the end of the day, I guess you can say that like, um, I realized that everything that we were doing was very wrong. It was very, very unproductive for ourselves. And upon getting out, I went back in two weeks later and it hit me that I felt more safe being locked up behind four doors, well, four walls and a door that could protect me from my family from the real world out there. So I did whatever it takes to just get incarcerated. I didn't care about getting caught. I just wanted to be locked up. I just wanted to be safe. 
I was issued three meals a day. I was issued a, my own bed. I was issued a shower. I never had that. So being locked up to me was my safe haven. It was what I desired. And when I ended up getting released at 14, uh, the gang life really opened up to me. And I only lasted up for, I only lasted two weeks in the streets because the gang thought it was gonna be okay for me to commit a crime because I was fresh out and they thought you were gone for so long. Like see if you're still about it. So I did it. I went in, got out. I was 15 and I was only out for 36 hours. And I took the life of a 65 year old man that was parked across the street from me doing his everyday job. Um, what led up to the crime was I was hurting and I was in a stage in my life where all I wanted was to do was change, but I didn't know how people tell us change, drop out, but fail to understand. Okay, I do that, but who am I after that? I didn't know about the identity crisis that you go through because you live under this character for so long that you don't even know who you are. You were taught to know who you thought you were, but once that's stripped out of you, you don't know who you really are. Well, I was hurting because of a lot of stress in my life and there's no justification for what I did. I wanted to make somebody feel what I felt and that's where that saying comes, hurt people, hurt people. And it was three of us, me, my best friend, and some other kid that we had picked up along the way. I thought it was gonna be a bright idea to go out for a joyride. And I remember it clearly, the man pulled up, was waiting for the field workers to come out of the house to get in his car. I ran up to the car with my friend. And when we opened the door, we told him, get get out of the car. And it hit me that what I was doing was bad. And I couldn't show that to my friends because I knew that at that moment, it was either him or me, or it was gonna be both of us. So I can remember the fear in his eyes. I can remember everything that he was experiencing. I know that in the end, like, he was asking us to just let him go. He was going to give us the that we do care. I do care about you, and I don't want you to be me, and you have a nice, blessed day. Thank you.